All right, hey guys, today we're doing a tear down of the GB Boy Color. I know one of you on Reddit wanted to see the screws taken out in full speed, but I think I'm just going to speed that up. Don't worry, the rest will be in normal speed, so you don't have to worry about that. All right, so there's two different types of screws. As you can see, most of these screws are actually Phillips, a standard Phillips screwdriver that's small enough should work. The top two screws are actually game bit screws, so that's a little bit weird. Um, yeah, so you can see here we're pulling apart the case. It's held together with this little wire. That's actually the game detect wire. Basically, when that little switch is pushed down, it connects those two um, points and tells the GB boy that there's a game inside. So it's nothing fancy to detect if there's a game inside or not. It's just that teeny tiny switch right there. When, again, when a game is pushed in, it just closes the circuit. So if you take off this switch or just uh, pull out the wires, it would always think there's no game inside. So you don't want to do that. All right, so these wires are pretty thin. Uh, this is a voiceover, sorry, I didn't record any audio when I was actually doing this, so. Alright, now let's get a close-up look at this board real quick. As you can see, it's not too good looking. Um, some of the pins on the, looks like the main processor look a little bit bent, and I don't know if that's flux or what, but it's a lot of stuff over in between the connections. I'll clean that up a little bit later, but it just doesn't look too great. Alright, now let's move on down to the bottom part of the board, where we have the card reader, and we have some capacitors. Each one of these is facing a different direction. And we also have the speaker wire, which is actually seems to be soldered to another point on the board. I'm not sure if that's how it's supposed to be. All right, so let's go ahead and compare this to the actual board of a Game Boy Color. Alright, as you can see, the Game Boy Color Board is a lot more busy. I'm not sure if it's just newer technology making things take up less space or what, but it is a pretty interesting comparison or contrast between the two. Like, you all those same main chips like the processors and stuff on both boards, but the Game Boy Color just has a way, whole lot more going on. And, I'm not even, and that's not even including the extra uh, infrared mounts, but yeah, it's a pretty interesting comparison. So, judging by this, I'm guessing the big one's a CPU. I'm not sure what the other two are. And we got quite a few more components on the Game Boy Color that also aren't on the GB Boy Color. But we still got a link port and volume control and all that important stuff. Alright, let's move these out of the way. I don't want to scratch up the screen any more than it already did. Alright, so there's two last little screws down here. Uh, one of them's a little bit more flat, which is kind of weird. I mean, normally all the board screws are flat, but... One's rounded and one's flat, so let's take this one out, and the other one I'm going to need to actually switch bits for. Alright, and here's a quick look at the Game Boy Color for comparison. The mounts are around the same spot, and it's still being held on by one last screw, which is actually on the cartridge reader. So just go ahead and pull that up, and then you'll be able to remove the actual board from the main for the front shell. Don't force it though because the screen is actually being held on by adhesive. Not adhesive on the screen and not adhesive on the shell, the actual sticker on the front, the little lens, is stuck directly to the screen, which is kind of weird. So it's pretty easy to get up. Um, you can use a small screwdriver, you just want to be careful not to touch the screen. It's a pretty big border though, just be careful. As you can see it just requires a little bit of force on the outside and that there's the adhesive. You can see on the lens that's what I was talking about. And unlike the Game Boy Color, the uh, screen ribbon cable connector thing is actually on the front as opposed to on the back. So here's a quick comparison of the two. And as you can see, the contacts look almost exactly the same. I think the A and B buttons are spaced out a little bit, which is something I'll have to adjust in the mod I'm doing this video. Again, this is recorded days after I actually did the mod. Um, yeah, so here, as you look, the D-pad actually is 100% compatible. So I'm going to replace this, because the, the thing about these little um, contact pads is the cheap ones and the ones that use the GB color, like the cheap replacements, usually have a weird consistency to them. They don't feel the same as the original Game Boy buttons. That's why I'm going to replace not only the D-pad, but also the D-pad uh, little spongy things. And if you look at these A and B buttons, this is why they feel so weird. They use this two-stage kind of um, contact design. And because of how big that little, uh, I can't remember the names of any of these, this is going to sound super stupid, but those little rubbery things determine how your buttons feel when you press them. It's not just the plastic itself, it's the actual contact pads. Alright, and here's the D-pad, the infamous D-pad that everybody hates. Um, a few people don't hate it, but most people consider this as one of the main reasons not to buy it. So, let's go ahead and compare this to something else. 
the D-pad seems to be almost the exact same size as the D-pad on the original Game Boy. So if you want a bigger D-pad replacement, you may be able to mod the shell to fit one in. But because of the rounding on the shell, I'm not sure if it would fit natively. That's why I decided to use the Game Boy Color uh, D-pad. Now, I've heard on Reddit that the Game Boy Pocket fits better, but I don't have an extra Game Boy Pocket. As you can see right here, I'm measuring the contact pads and seeing that the contact pads are exactly the same. All right, uh, let's go ahead and see. I'm just checking the sizing again. And here's where I'm taking out the D-pad and see how it just fits in perfectly. All right, there's nothing much you can really do about the start and select buttons. One, I don't have the extra ones. And two is if you look at the contacts, on the actual GB Boy board, they're spaced out quite a bit. So if I had some, I could check, but I think if you want to mod in the original Game Boy Start and Select buttons, you probably have to cut them in half and space them out and do something weird with the shell. And right here, I found out that the A and B buttons don't fit because they're actually keyed. There's little pegs on the outside. I don't know if I'll show a close up, but there's little pegs on the outside of the A and B buttons, so you don't put them in the wrong slot of an actual Game Boy shell. And because of this keying, you can't actually use them in the Game Boy in the GB Boy color. Sorry. Which is kind of disappointing. Oh yeah, if you're wondering what this thing up here is, that's the, uh, it's pretty much a flash cart or, that holds all your built-in games. So I don't know exactly what that's wired to. It'd be interesting to trace and find out. But that has all your built-in games, so when you when the switch is not triggered, it will load all your games off of that as opposed to reading from a cartridge. That would be interesting if you could reflash that. I think some people were asking about that. So you could put LSDJ on there. That would be pretty cool. Although I don't think it supports saving. But if you could figure out actually how it's wired to the uh, ROM chip, maybe you could have a permanent built-in game or a list of your own games that you wanted. Alright, so right here I'm just looking through the different components I have for both of the uh, units. If you've seen my Reddit post about the mod, you already know what I'm doing ahead of time. What I'm basically doing is I'm putting the original contacts and the original D-pad in the GBoo Boy color for this mod. This way I'll be able to have a more authentic feel while still having a GBoo Boy Colors backlit screen. All right, and just looking at these shells, it looks like the opening is about the same for both the GB Boy Color and the original Game Boy Color. So that means I might be able to actually put a glass lens on here. The only disadvantage is, as you can probably tell, the power light is in a different place. Now, the power light is just a simple LED, so all I'd have to do is just um, desolder that, run some wires down and resolder it, and figure out some way to actually make it stand up straight. But I'm not going to worry about that right now. As you can see here, the... Um, Light is way higher up on the GB Boy Color. But the fact that the GB Boy Color has such a large lens is not the problem. It's the fact that the screens are slightly different sizes. So if I do replace the lens, that probably means that I'll have a little bit of screen that's uh, not visible. But I'm just going to go ahead and try it anyway. I'll probably buy like a cheap $3 lens just to give it a try. And I'll post the results when I do get around to doing that. As you can see, the nice thing is... Um, the D-pad actually has these two little holes on it, the contacts, sorry, the contacts for the D-pad have these two little holes, and they're the exact same spacing away as the ones from the official contact pad from the Game Boy Color. Now that means that, again, not only do I get the cool original D-pad, but I also get the original squishiness of the original contacts because I'm using, I hate saying original so many times, basically, so I'm using the original contact pads, I get the original feel of the buttons, and I get the original shape of the D-pad. Now, if I can bring this up on camera, as you can see, it fits the A and B buttons contact pads, which means I will get the original feel. The problem is, I believe the spacing is a tiny bit off. Also, if you can't, this is just no pegs to hold the D-pad, sorry, there's no pegs to hold the A and B buttons in place, um, they slip. So, usually when I put a case together, they'll slip, and one of the buttons won't be perfectly centered, meaning that either A or B is not super sensitive. That can be an issue, because that means that uh, I lose, uh, what is it? Button consistency, that's not the right word. Sometimes when I press a button, it just doesn't register. I think if I cut them, I can probably tape each one onto the contacts and probably get a better uh, overall experience of that, but I'm not going to worry about that right now. Right now, I'm just doing a very basic mod. All right, and now time for some quick cleaning. We're going to speed this up because it's pretty mundane, and hopefully all of you know how to do this by now. What we're doing is we're first cleaning up the contact pads a little bit. These things are like 15, 20 years old. I don't know how long I've had my original Game Boy, so they need to be cleaned. Also, I cleaned up the contacts on the board a little bit too. Now what we're going to try to do is actually put the thing back together. So this is kind of difficult because the screen is has to fit in between two rows of little rubber spacers. So trying to get it to perfectly line up takes a little bit of work. As you can see here, it's slightly tilted. 
but it's good enough. All right, so now I'm gonna try to clean up these contacts. They're a little bit bad, but just a little bit of rubbing alcohol, get, take that right up, isopropyl, sorry. And yeah, I know cleaning the top of the chips does not actually do much, but it will help the new photos come out a little bit better. Uh, so you guys can get the numbers. All right, now we're gonna try to put it back together. And oh, looks like we have a little bit of a problem. Forgot the power switch. Now you gotta be careful, the power switch only goes in one way. If you try to put it in upside down, you won't be able to actually close the case. So don't try to force it closed. I think that's what I did here, was I tried to um, force it closed and the power switch was in upside down. That's why it doesn't close all the way. So what I ended up doing was just taking it out for now and just closing the case where I can test it. Basically, before you put any screws in, you always want to test it. Anyone who's done any kind of DIY work knows that. But uh, for those of you who don't, yeah. All right, now let's go ahead and test it out. I'm going to go ahead and load up some batteries in the game, and we'll see if it still actually even powers up. All right, so batteries, and just popped in Pokemon Crystal version. Let's power it on. Remember, the switch is still out. All right, and it looks like it's starting up, so we, that means we're good. All right, we can go ahead and test these buttons if we want to. So, all right, uh, C, A, B, and B looks like it gets a little bit off. So we may have to go ahead and fix that. Let's go ahead and turn this off. Take the batteries out and the game out. If you leave the game in, you can still access the front panel. That's all we need. But if you want to be able to take the back off and change things on the back, you'll probably want to do that. There's still some weird residue on the front, too. So let's go ahead and clear that up, too. We're also using isopropyl for this. This may not be the best way to clean the board, but it's safe and effective. All right, now we're going to put the screen back up. And we're going to go ahead and try to reposition. This time we'll use tape to hold the button pads in. Because on my previous test, I didn't show it all. But the A and B buttons weren't super or responsive is the right word. So by taping them to the board, we should be able to keep them in place a little bit better. Now all we got to do is match up the two halves and hope the screen stays in place. And since we weren't doing anything in the back, we didn't need to take out the game before. But it does make it easier to close the shell. Alright, now the next thing we're going to do is go ahead and put the power switch back in. Again, it's really weird and it's keyed and if you put it in the wrong way, it causes issues. Alright, so next thing we're going to do is actually remove the built-in games. Remember how I said it's just the switch that causes the issue? Well, what we're going to do is um, just tap the both contacts with a soldering iron, and we're able to pull both wires off cleanly. Alright, now what we're going to do is I was going to try to actually connect both contacts with the solder that's already on the board, but apparently there wasn't enough. So what I'm going to have to do is actually manually get some solder and go ahead and combine the two contacts because right now it would always think there's no game in there so what we got to do is get just enough solder on the board so that both of these two contacts are always connected this way it will always think there's a game in the cartridge and it will never load the built-in games all right that should do it all right let's try to neaten this up a little bit because it basically was kind of spiking a little bit so i don't want that i'm going to try to smooth it out All right, clean this off. All right, and let's take a look. Uh, not the best job, but it's nice and low profile, so we don't have to worry about it bumping into anything. All right, and it still fits in the shell, but unfortunately we have two open wires here. We don't want to cause any short, so what I originally planned to do was just tape off these wires. So I put tape around the first one, just in case I wanted to reuse it, but then when I got the second one, it broke the wire off, so I just pulled both wires off since one of them broke, but it's kind of cheap. Now let's load up some batteries and test it out. And if it starts up, that means our soldering job was good. And as you can see, we're able to load the game. And the buttons work just fine. At least the D-pad does. Let's go ahead and test out the A button. All right, so in case you weren't sure what we were testing, basically, um, if our soldering job wasn't successful, as soon as we try to start up this thing with a game or without a game, it would automatically launch the built-in games. Since we were able to launch our cartridge, that means that we did a good job. All right, so now since our buttons are working, which we just tested, and our uh, anti-piracy mod is working, we're good to go. So we can go ahead and put these uh, screws back on the board, as shown here, and then we'll be we're pretty much just ready to close up the unit. And another good lesson for taking things apart is always label your screws. I had a hard time trying to figure out where each screw was supposed to go on this thing. There are just so many holes in the board. I'm not even sure if all, all of them are four screws. But I eventually did get it together, and I only ended up losing one screw out of this entire process. 
So there are three to go on the board, I believe, and then the rest is going to the actual panel. I tried to see if an actual Game Boy Color back would even fit on this thing, and unfortunately, because of size and shaping differences, it did not. I was pretty disappointed. But anyway, moving back to the assembly, I actually lost one of the screws, so I just put enough screws in the case, and I figured the board would be fine on its own. So go ahead and test it again. When you put every single time you take it apart all the way, I suggest testing it once you put it back together, just to be safe and save yourself some time. Then just go ahead and put in the housing screws and you're all set. So, okay, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Sorry it wasn't too professional. I tried to do a live commentary style thing, so it kind of feels like I'm talking while reassembling it. But unfortunately, that makes it super unprofessional. So, oh well. I hope you guys enjoyed this video anyway, and I'll see you in the next one. Which will certainly be more professional. Alright, bye.